These ones being recorded, click a button. There we go. Whoops. Which screen am I showing? Hold on. <laughs> Try that again. Screen one, share. There we go. So let me just start the slide presentation. And everybody should be able to see bridging the gap between division three and division nine. You have to expand the page to full screen, Keith. Perfect. So a new perspective. So basically there's gonna be a lot of home truths in this discussion. Um, Keith, Keith yes. just hang on. you'd have to expand the slideshow so you show full page because I've only got uh, small images. Have you got full screen on your? Yes, I do. Let me let me again make sure I'm sharing the correct screen. Screen three. There we go. Try that one. Share. Try that again. F five. Bridging there the gap. There we go. Now we got it. Now you got it. Okay. That that was that was user uh, error, not uh, not <clears throat> Zoom error. So uh, yeah, so like I said, there's gonna be a lot of home truths in this discussion. Some of the learning points will be provocative and that's intended to be so to get people to question what we're doing. Um, some of the attendees may find the content unpleasant. Um, it's not to point fingers at anybody. It really is just to outline the problems that we've been, uh, that we've held for such a long time. And sometimes it takes a, a, a bit of a knock up the side of the head to understand what we're actually getting ourselves into. But the goal of the presentation is to make all attendees aware of the issues associated with their individual contributions to the quality of concrete substrates and floor covering installations. And more importantly, about the contributions of all project participants for project outcomes. Um, very quickly, we're going to uh, break the, break the uh, subject matter down into three, three major topic areas. Um, we want to identify the disconnect, how its specifications actually lead to rejection. Um, it happens specifications aren't specific and ambiguity actually comes up and becomes everybody's enemy. Uh, we're also going to be looking at how the construction uh, specifications assume the slab will meet the floor covering installer's needs. That's just plain wrong. Uh, and of course, why the concrete finishing trade will meet their spec for flatness but in the end, the floor installers still cannot proceed with their work. Um, all, all of that led to the greatest understanding of, of my personal career. And that was actually connecting the dots and how the specification can actually work to solving those problems. Understanding the relationships between the different parts of the specification, such as like the front end documents and the trade divisions um, will bring about the, the necessary understanding. And of course, then we're also looking at the action, which which we really have to un unroll this new specification. Um, it's, it's different than a traditional spec and also why it benefits everybody on the project team. Now, Keith, by front end documents, you are talking division zero and division one? Correct, yeah, the bidding documents, contract documents, which are division zero and division one, which are the general requirements, kind of the administrative rules of the game type stuff. So for me, th this began a very long time ago. Um, there's, there's a friend of mine at work, Mike. It's easier to call him Mike. He's an architect. He manages projects. He designs stuff. Um, it was the beginning of the pandemic kind of thing. And, and we were getting a bit stale sitting at home. So we arranged to go for a reasonably uh, socially distanced walk through, through the woods. We share the same ravine behind our houses. Um, so, but it, and he, and he, he was really anxious to talk to me and, and, and the, the walk lasted a lot longer than I had expected. But the conversation kind of started off, Keith, I think there's something wrong with the specification. And, you know, being a little defensive, I said, mm, really, in what way? And then he went on to describe at length problems that he was having with concrete slabs, disagreements on site between the constructor, who was the GC or the construction manager or design builder, and the concrete finishing trades and the floor covering installers. So I, I have to explain first off specifications that we, we call those things disconnects. 
Um, they're not a disagreement, they're not a dispute because there's no legal action involved typically. And if we can find a solution before it goes that far, all the better. Um, but he was asked, he was being asked to prepare a change order to account for additional materials and labor associated with correcting the slabs so that the floor coverings could then proceed. So he, he had a series of questions about why you should process this change order. And, and his first question came down to, if we specified appropriate tolerance for the concrete, why isn't the concrete trade repairing the problem? And I, I had to tell him, well, the concrete trade has already met their tolerance requirements. Measurements were made on the floor and found to be acceptable on the date that their work was completed. He says, okay, so... Uh, but why is the floor guy rejecting? Why is the floor guy rejecting? And I said, well, con you know, concrete will change. And he says, well, if we know concrete's gonna change, why are we asked, being asked to process this change order? And I said, well, you know, in the end, concrete is constantly changing. Corrections need to be made to provide an appropriate service condition for the floor carving installer. You could have said, welcome to the gap right there. Could have said, welcome to the gap. And it's like, that, that's our world. And, and so then he looks, he says, so, uh, well, doesn't the spec actually identify corrections to the concrete? And I said, well, actually, no, the specification does not describe correction, not in the way you expect. It defines the acceptable concrete tolerances in division three, describes what the floor covering installer needs to apply their products in division nine. It, it, it you know, basically says, and this is a note for spec writers, there is a gap here. This is the gap. And at the same time, it assumes that the, the two will dovetail, that they will and, line up. Yeah, at this point in time, they don't. So we need to create that dovetail. So he says, oh, right then. So, well, who's responsible for correcting the concrete? And I said to him, I don't really know. The spec describes what is required. In, the, in this case, the uh, flooring manufacturer's tolerances and the constructor determines how the work is done. Constructor is responsible for means and methods. The design professional is responsible for the design intent. Um, yeah, and by the way, the floor covering tolerances only uh, allow for minor corrections to adjust concrete smoothness uh, to make things work. And to make things work. So in short, you've got um, tolerances put in place by the specification that, that guide the concrete finisher to leave the slab at around three eighths or half inch over 10 feet. Yeah, typical concrete finishing work. It's it's what's achievable with the tools. Um, you know, uh, they they use slightly different terms. You know, FF twenty five to FF thirty. You know, maybe if you want a really tight tolerance, FF thirty five uh, before you start getting into special tools and materials. And the, but the floor covering contractor comes to the table expecting a slab that is offered to him or provided to him at three sixteenths over yeah. 10 feet. And, yeah. there, and that's without all this natural deformation, this natural sagging and curling that goes on. That is just right out of the gate. The two specifications that guide both trades do not line up. And it only gets worse as the project ages. Only gets worse, yes. Yeah, and I don't wanna say worse because it's a natural phenomenon. So it's not, it's not a mistake. I wanna make gap, that absolutely gap. clear. Let's say the gap grows from there. Yeah, and that, that came down to it. So, you know, this is like, how can the spec fix this problem? And it really comes down to coordination. We need to find a way to coordinate Division Three and Division Nine. And as I said, the, the front end document in particular, Division One, those are the rules of the game. That's where the action happens. So <laughs> this, is a, this is a part of the problem. As we walked down this path, it was like bears were kind of jumping out of the, out of the woods, you know, being lost in the woods. Being in familiar surroundings and encountering those situations that were not a normal part of your of your walk. Um, so I had to explain that I've had similar conversations with our interior designers or structural engineers where I work. I've also had same, similar conversations with with other specifications writers all across North America. And it, it's obvious that there's something going on, but we don't know what to do about it. And, and frankly, what we have been doing is tightening up the concrete tolerances, you know, to higher and higher performances and still failing to, to, to 
bridge the gap as you like. And Mike kind of looked at me and he said, so what are you going to do about this? And, it, and he was very emphatic about me. What are you going to do about it? Um, and that's a normal kind of question when we're trying to solve design issues. Uh, if we know there's a problem, can we, being the design community, find a way to help resolve the problem? Is there a way to make sure that trades are not being asked to perform work that they are not familiar with or that they haven't included in their bids um, you know, without the, the need for, for making a change to the construction? In the end, the goal would be for the specification to identify work that has cost, that is required to address concrete corrections, and that prevents rejection of one trade's work to benefit a different trade's expectations. And so we come to, we need to clearly, the ambiguousness of the specification actually arises uh, because they do not recognize or understand the sequence of work and as a consequence become non-specific. <laughs> and trust me, specifications should not be ambiguous. They become ambiguous when information associated with flatness, levelness uh, between division three, what concrete requires, with division nine, what floor covering requires is not accounted for in the specification. And the single biggest assumption is that concrete tolerances apply to floor covering tolerances. That, that was the wake up call. There is a totally different way to approach this problem. And also that the measurement system used for concrete applies to the floor covering trade, it does not. It, it roughly loosely sort of suggests that it may maybe does, but it does not for reasons I think you're gonna explain a little later on. So I won't, I won't uh, get into yeah, that. Yeah, and that's the point, Chris, is, is it's not the tolerances that change, it's the way we measure things. Division three, it relies on an ASTM, very exact standard test method for determining floor flatness, floor levelness. We've all seen these as FF, FL numbers. Um, the are made within three days of concrete being placed. Nine series of points across the floor. Um, they result in a statistical evaluation. The number is a whole number. Uh, it, it's just a compilation of different measurements across the floor. Um, that test can be performed within a defined area. So within offset from con uh, construction joints, lines of structure, things like that. And there's a different test out of the same standard for measurement across the boundary conditions like construction joints and structural things so that we can get an overall picture of the floor. It's a quantitative test. I want to stress quantitative. Division nine is a qualitative test. This is defined by ASTM F710. It's a different standard and it's a standard practice. It's not a standard test. And it's all about preparing concrete floors to receive resilient flooring. Um, the tests are made to determine the extent of corrections that are required before flooring installation begins and suggest different methods that can be used to visually judge the quality of the concrete. Identify this hard math, right? So I, I, the floor cover identifies problems um, that are, once you've met three sixteenths over 10 feet or one eighth over 10 feet or whatever the manufacturer's product requires, then the, the straight edge test is really just identifying problems that may telegraph through the uh, floor covering and cause rejection later on. They're not, uh, they're almost not measuring at that point. They're just trying to identify lumps and bumps and problems that need to be knocked down under their trade scope of work. Yeah, and, and Chris can tell you, like we've both been involved in, in, in conversations dealing with straight edge and there's a lot of, uh, don't be ridiculous, straight edge doesn't work. That's why we're using the dipstick, but then it doesn't recognize that uh, floor trades have an instant technique that requires the use of a straight edge. Um, and it really is the best way to assess that, that qualitative requirement. By the way, both of those test methods have uh, appendixes in them, appendices in them that actually identify that additional corrections may be required to meet tolerances of other materials being applied to the concrete. That's another one of those aha moments. It would be good to have one measurement system that just does it for both right out of the gate. <clears throat> I don't think we have an answer for that, Chris. 
And we do, <laughs> yes, I'll leave you to this. Yes, we do. It. Yeah, so we, we have two, uh, two contributing um, Amer uh, uh, standards organizations, the American Concrete Institute and the American Society of Concrete Contractors, who've actually identified these as the, 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 the different measurement systems as a concern. Um, and then in fact, uh, ASCC has a position statement on division six that says clearly, concrete division three, we measure very, very accurately. Division nine, you measure using straight edge, more of a visual sense of what's going on. American Concrete Institute actually has specific guidance for managing the tolerance compatibility issues in concrete construction. Both of these documents are well worth a read. They're easily searchable. Um, in fact, the ACI 117.1R says that it's the consultant, the uh, architect and engineer that are responsible for coordinating those tolerance compatibilities and identifying them to the constructor so that the trades can be coordinated. Um, a lot more on this is, is in the first of the deep dives, managing and coordinating tolerance compatibility. As Chris said, that one conversation can go on for another 10 or 15 minutes, which is time we don't really have for, so deep, for the session. So managing and coordinating ability between Div 3, Div 9 is a deep dive video that will be sent out to everybody on, who registered for this uh, webinar. What about CSA A23.1? Where does it fit in? Uh, excellent question, Chris. Yes, CSA A23.1. Um, for those, before, you, uh, Keith, before you go down that rabbit hole, what is CSA A23.1? Because not everybody will understand that. Right. CSA, Canadian Standards Association, uh, A23.1 is the national standard and two is the national uh, standard for concrete materials and concrete installation. It describes the engineer's responsibilities, the contractor's responsibilities for achieving uh, structurally sound concrete. It does reference tolerances, um, but it hasn't really highlighted uh, anything outside of the concrete work. Um, Chris and I have both been sitting on, on a, a subcommittee um, for A23.1, and we brought in non-structural tolerance recognition for suspended slabs. A lot of that stuff can be applied also to slabs on grade um, and other, um, other concrete uh, uh, tolerance issues. Um, the, the big thing, concrete deforms naturally. It's what concrete does. Construction joints can be decreased by, by you know, changing, oh yes, and curling and warping occur largely at construction joints. If we've got the concrete mix design, can actually decrease flatness measurements by about 50%. That's kind of an exaggerated look of, of what it looks like. And if you, if, if you engage with your structural engineers, architects and interior designers engage with structural engineers at the start of, uh, of, of design, we can actually address this problem, reduce the amount of curling um, just by adding another uh, mat of reinforcing steel. And it's not much reinforcing steel that to, to resist this curling pressure. And curling occurs on slabs on grades because water tends to want to drive out faster out of the top of the slab than the bottom of the slab. And these days with all the radon uh, membranes we're putting underneath concrete slabs, that just happens more because of course the plastic sheet underneath the concrete wants to hold moisture there. And it just, it just accentuates the curling issues that we uh, already, uh, they've been around since the 1980s when we start, first started putting vapor barriers underneath concrete slabs. Um, the other side of that is concrete deflects naturally suspended slabs. So deflection of suspended slabs will change slab flatness measurements between the time that those initial measurements are made and when floor coverings are installed. One of the, there's a couple of ways the, the architect and engineer try to address that. Uh, one is we try to make a stiffer floor. Less deflection means less deviation in the amount of flatness across the, uh, the, the suspended slab. The other thing, and, and I say we've been doing it, but it hasn't been successful, is increasing the flatness tolerance. And, and I missed hello. you too much. I was telling daddy how much I missed you today. Hello, could you mute yourself? Sorry. Um, so yes, yeah, so the, um, 
So the uh, uh, consultants, they get together and like I say, we can stiffen the floor and we can make the floor flatter. But the problem is, is when concrete deflects, when it warps, the flatter the, the flatter the F number, in other words, the higher the F number, FF50, the greater the amount of change, which means we can put down an FF50 floor and what we have at, 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 as, as a consequence from that on a standard stiffness floor is an FF18 by the time we, all the concrete has come out to where it wants to be. So we know the deflection is coming yet. We still, we need a spec that, that accommodates that, 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 um, that catches it. Yeah, now there's a couple of things that, that are probably better than doing uh, adjusting stiffness or flatness. We can camber the formwork, you know, create a kind of a reverse curvature so that when the, the concrete does deflect that it kind of comes back to near zero. I'm not gonna say that's a guarantee. So uh, keeping in mind that that's an expensive operation. The other thing we can do is just recognize that, you know what, if we need a flat floor and floors are gonna deflect, our structural engineers can account for that additional dead load. It adds some cost to the, the, the concrete, it adds some cost to the foundations, but compared to the headache of trying to coordinate the, uh, the, the floor flatness or the, the gap tolerance required for the floor trades, it's a very good trade-off. And frankly, what we found is, is installing um, underlayments and toppings, it costs less than trying to repair a, a, a slab condition. Um, many times we're not even able to correct the slab condition because we can't grind the high spots because um, it, it decreases the thickness of concrete and affects fire ratings and structural um, retention so of the is, reinforcing steel. So this behooves us to really deal with this at the design stage before contracts are issued. Otherwise, you're trying to fix something you cannot fix on site because you can't grind the slab maybe because you've got a structural issue. You can't add weight to it because you've got a structural issue. Um, yeah. It all starts at the at the design stage. Yeah, Looking and, and that's early design stage too, Chris. Not not after completion of construction documents or in the middle of construction documents. This needs to be identified right at the start of design during schematic design, probably start of design development. So, and this can be planned for. Your graph at the bottom there, L three sixty is is a term I'm kind of used to seeing in project documents which seems to be the average looking for about a one inch deflection in between support points on a on a typical slab but then you go to l480 and l960 just for the audience's sake that that is essentially putting more steel and, and strength into the slab so that it just deflects less moves less yeah that can be important for you know large rigid materials going on a slab because the degree of curvature on the slab as it deflects has a bigger impact on those kinds of materials, not so much on resilient flooring. Um, the only time I've ever done an L over 960, uh, which is an extremely stiff floor, was for a laser lab at the University of Alberta. So it's, it's very rare, very, very, very expensive. And we still don't achieve what we need for floor coverings, which you know, says that basically we're giving the owner a Ferrari when they only need a Cadillac you know, or, or a Chevy for that matter. So it's a lot more cost effective to plan on uh, an L360 and, and add a topping than it is to plan an L960 and expect it to be hope, hope, hope that it, it turns out flat. Correct. So it's all about managing the concrete, right? So we need to manage curling and deflection and we need to manage the straight edge versus the uh, FFFL measurement um, differentials. Both of those are deep dives as well. So videos will be released getting into the, uh, the weeds on the subject of curling and deflection and FFFL. But just for the, for the sake of our talk today, um, just describe why it is that FFFL does not cut it for, doesn't help the floor contractor. You can, you can have the concrete trade meet their specification obligation or, or tolerances back in January when the slab is finished, uh, having used the FFFL measurement system. But right out of the gate, it's not gonna meet the floor guys because the floor guys requirements because those measurements stop. They don't cover the whole floor plate. Correct, yeah, they're, they're in very defined areas, usually either at 45 degrees across a bay 
or in four lines around the perimeter of the bay offset from construction joints and structure lines. Um, it doesn't really give that, that impression of the overall bumpiness, the undulations and the dips and doodles that are natural to concrete and that the uh, floor covering people are actually responsible for uh, smoothing. Um, this is outside of the correction that's required. Um, the other big aha moment was the floor covering tolerance is a starting tolerance, right? So the, that five millimeter and three meter, the three sixteenths inch gap is, is measured, one using an unleveled straight edge and is required before any flooring work starts. It's not something that the floor covering people have to bring the floor to. This, is, this, this has to be in place before floor covering trade is even brought to site. Because, um, because, because floor covering scope of work doesn't, you know, where the floor covers work starts under his trade scope and ends, uh, does not include correction of concrete beyond that 3 sixteenths over 10 feet. Floor covers aren't trained to do that under the Red Seal program or any training program. It's, uh, you know, it's not to say that some floor covers don't tool up and have labor that is specializing uh, in, in that work, but most do not because it's not part of the trade scope of work. Now, I think don't specify as one of their challenges is to understand um, where trade scope starts and ends so that when they're writing instructions, they don't overlap one trades work into another's and, and you get this conflict. I don't do that, I do this. Yeah, and that's a good point. Uh, spec writers, of course, they're trained that we do not define scope by our specifications. And that is that is true. Scope is defined by the constructor. But spec writers have to be aware of trade scope so that they can write, you know, I, I like to say we stitch together and knit together the spec so that it's it's dependent on something. If you pull a thread out of something knitted, you know, it's all going to fray and fall apart. It's the same thing with specs. There's a, there, there is a way of coordinating in the, the specs so that all those things can come together. The problem with what we've been challenged with here is we've not been aware of these different requirements, the different measuring systems, because for all the years we've been focused on FFFL. And in part, that's also due to how the standards use FFFL. You know, um, you know the, the, the standard itself created a, a gap tolerance of an eighth inch equivalency for an FF50. So we say, right, we need an eighth of an inch, FF50, go for it. Well, of course, the FF50, by the time uh, the floor trades comes along, is actually an FF30. Uh, it's still a good floor, but it doesn't meet that eighth inch requirement. And, that, and that's something else here too. The five millimeter is a general expectation. Floor covering people can usually deal with all of this, but there are other, but there are manufacturer tolerances that have to be accounted for. Large rigid uh, uh, requires, you know, a three millimeter tolerance. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, VCT requires a three millimeter tolerance. Yeah, many, many floor manufacturers call for one eighth over 10 feet. Yeah. Um, many carpets very good at hiding the problem. So carpet only requires a, uh, you know, three eighths tolerance. So really it, it's, it always defaults back to the, it's the manufacturer that's requiring these high tolerances, not actually the flooring, flooring installer. Um, it's the manufacturer's product, which was chosen by the consultant and the owner. And so that's what brings this high tolerance to the uh, to the table here. Yeah, and I, I think it's important to know here that because we know that there's a difference, we have an ending tolerance for concrete for acceptability. You know, if we got FF25 on, on day three, you're good to go, which actually, as you said, provides a six millimeter to an eight millimeter gap. Uh, we've already started with a differential. Um, the, it's a known unknown. We know this is already in place. And it, because it's known, we can account for it in some of the some of the procedures that we're going to outline in the new spec. Um, oh yeah, and some institutions, by the way, hospitals, universities, will also require just as a starting point a tighter uh, starting tolerance for all all finished floors. 
uh, again, probably the best way to achieve any, any hospital or institutional project is to realize that, yeah, we're gonna use uh, uh, underlayments, toppings to achieve the, the, the fine um, smooth, uh, level of flatness and levelness that the client requires. Um, yeah, and again, just a reminder, concrete correction must be completed before straight edge measurements occur. We need to avoid, the specifier needs to avoid concrete, they're the easy bait um, and ultimately will lead to more disconnects and conflicts on the work site. Um, uh, we also need to assess tolerances based on best practice guidelines. And I find the best way to do that is actually talk to your concrete people, talk to your floor trades. They will tell you, they deal with this every single day, every week, every month, all year long. Um, the other thing that needs to be done before starting flooring is that all the testing, all the qualitative testing for moisture, alkalinity, absorption of the surface it has to be done before Division 9 is called to site. Um, typically, testing is, is paid for by the owner, either directly or in the form of a cash allowance administered by the, the constructor because it's third party. Um, the, the owner pays for those tests to confirm that what, they're, what is being built is meeting what they're where they are paying for. You don't buy this is what we were talking about this morning, Chris. You don't buy the Ferrari with with Firestone wide oval tires. You better get the the Pirellis with with what you're paying for. You know, this is just an opportunity to I mean talk about the quantitative versus qualitative, which we get in the flatness measurement uh, systems. Yeah, it applies to moisture as well. Like, um, you know, there's quantitative moisture testing. A, driven by ASTMs, whether it's 2170 or 1869 calcium chloride drill test. And then there's qualitative, which would be what the floor covering installer is expected to carry out a, uh, what we call an indicator moisture test, just a way of determining when it's now time to take a quantitative moisture test. That needs to be clearly identified in the spec. And I think the spec that you've written and put, um, and uh, uh, we're putting out there, uh, absolutely identifies that so there's no more ambiguity on that subject yeah there's testing that is coordinated and and perhaps even performed by the 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 general contractor the constructor and then there's that qualitative is 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 the conditions that are being turned over to me as the floor trade can i can i confirm that i'm good to go because as soon as i start putting down my flooring as a floor trade i'm i i've now accepted the site condition so it, it, it's, it's, it's a risk management thing for the floor trades. It's also a risk management thing for the concrete people and the constructor. And it's important to understand starting tolerance. If you don't correct the surface condition, you can end up with high points on the floor. Um, one, visually, it's not it's not acceptable because it can actually create a visual tripping hazard in certain conditions. Um, the second part of this is it actually diminishes the lifespan of the product because as you scrub over this, this bump in the, in, in the floor, it actually erodes the floor and decreases the lifespan of the product that the owner has paid for. Um, this is a good example of where uh, on a suspended slab that a floor topping has, has or an underlayment has actually been applied. It easily meets the flooring specification and relieves the, the concrete trades of, of any, uh, any potential um, requirement to go back and correct their, 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 their surfaces. Um, this is what, Chris, this is a good, like, I remember better uh, than sixteenths of an inch gap here. I remember I, I, I took that photograph. That's my straight edge on site there. It was like, uh, this is a high rise multifamily and the, the project team had planned a topping, which I think was placed around four months after the parent slabs were um, finished. And um, I couldn't find anything over 1 16th, over 10 feet anywhere, even up against a support column like that, where you typically get a horrible drop off in two or three lineal feet away from the support point. It was immaculate, but exceeded tolerance, and all the trades were just sort of grinning from ear to ear, saying, "This works. This is great. We can anticipate what's needed. We get on with our jobs." It's, it's, and I think three towers got done this way. And if if the first tower hadn't gone well, they wouldn't have done the other two. So it just takes planning and budgeting so that you can execute this way. 
Yeah, and we can account for that topping in the specification, by the way. You know, um, you know, if we know the slabs, it's the known unknown will deflect and will will change from day one to day 151. Um, we can identify how to cost, right? So if we are anticipating somewhere between 20% and 60% change in, in flatness, well, we can dive right in between and say, well, well, you know, let's expect that, you know, we're going to be correcting to 40% with, with, a, with an, a, a cementitious a self-leveling um, compound. That can be accounted for in the construction price. And then we can also account for, you know, add or delete prices by introducing a unit price cash allowance. And nobody wants to really talk about that. But it is a good suggestion that's been put forward by both ACI and ASCC. And I also believe that the A23.1 makes reference to cash allowances for concrete corrections. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's all about the budget. I mean, everyone's sort of thinking, well, yeah, sure, you can get them flat, but it's going to cost an arm and a leg. No one's going to pay for it. But, you know, if I'm a if I'm an invest part of an investment group and there's five people coming to the table, everybody's got $10 million and it's a $50 million build um, and a hundred thousand dollars worth of leveling is, is the add on. I, I don't mind bringing in the small amount of for the budgets are set, but if once it's all said and done, I don't want to receive that, uh, you know, that $10,000 bill after the fact. So this really is about getting it right and, and understood amongst the design team so that they know this could be the best way to move forward to satisfy everybody. Otherwise it's delays and the same old rejection of slab and missed deadlines and nothing but trouble. Yeah, it's about managing risk. And that, that is, I think what everybody needs is, is safe, reliable risk management. So we can also measure for concrete correction. This, this is the cool part, right? This is all about laser imaging. So we can measure floor profiles at regular times after the initial FFFL uh, has been accept, accepted and we can track the changes of the concrete and actually verify the amount of corrections that need to be made as, as the project goes forward. Um, this is just one particular instrument. Um, it, and, and it provides great visualization to the floor and you can change the data output to suit different trades. So if you want to actually visualize the high points and low points, this is called a heat map. Um, and it's of, of a you know, 60,000 square meter hospital in lower mainland BC. Um, the, the only way really to manage the high points and low points on this was really with a cut and fill, um, similar to what you do in road work. And, and can, the information actually, was changed. Sorry, uh, I was just going to say the next slide. You can you can take these measurements on a busy site. It's not like everybody has to be uh, you know, has to be done at night necessarily. But uh, these this technology is coming down in price, and it's much more versatile. And uh, the individual who shared us this image said it took two man days to execute this um, this plan, this map. Yeah, so provided that there, there is fixed reference points set up on each floor level so that the laser can align itself, you can literally move that laser around anywhere on the floor and get real-time measurements. Um, in this particular case, this map was made by a, a, a concrete correction contractor. There are specialists in this work and that's all they do. And you can see where they've identified different high points, low points, areas that are gonna be corrected. So it gives them already a, a quantity estimate of, of the kind of work that they're gonna be doing. Um, boy, oh boy, uh, you can't talk about specifications unless you talk about people's perceptions of the specification. I, I, I'm, I'm seriously a, a firm believer in the why saying, simple, clear purpose and principles give rise to complex and intelligent behavior and trying to throw in complex rules and regulations give rise to simple and stupid behavior. The trouble being, I think, is that specifications give the impression of establishing complex rules, which really distracts from the clear purpose they actually provide to the, the people that have to read the document. I, I say, trust me, as a person that writes specifications, writer, uh, specifications for a living, living, there's nothing worse than having specs remain unread. Um, means that, that me and other people like me have a pretty wor worthless job 
kind of like this guy at that uh, at an Olympic swim meet. Well, the problem is a few bad apples will spoil the bunch. And you know, I know as a tradesperson myself, you you read, read the spec and you instantly tell it's 10, 15 years old. It's just been cut and pasted out of the past into a current project, which does not meet the needs of current, for example, adhesives, uh, water-based versus petroleum-based, a completely different animal. And so oh. why read the spec? It's a waste of my time. And this is devalues the whole industry, which is a great shame because it's, with the amount of retiring, experienced, old guard that's going on, leaving the young guard to try and figure things out, we need good specs more than ever, I think, in this industry. Yeah, and I, and, I, and, and that's, that's the good lead-in. And, and, and you're absolutely right. If somebody uses an out-of-date spec, and, and by the way, the old petroleum-based adhesives were already disappearing in the early 2000s, so it's been almost 20 years. So if you have a spec that still says that, you know, um, don't don't perpetuate the the problem. Um, but really, it only comes to light when you need this guy when something goes wrong, right? So if something happens at the job site, the specs are cracked open or they're pulled out from underneath the door, which is completely holding the door open on a windy day, and somebody gets hit with them, uh, you know, or you know, basically made to do something because something that was in the spec uh, uh, was actually required. Um, yeah, this is, is another one of those. Point. Yeah, go the, ahead. The spec is used to point fingers at that at that point after the fact, which is too yeah. bad. And so it's not the way the spec was ever intended to be used. Right. Yeah. So this is another one of those perceptions. Specifications tell me what to do, and they're usually wrong, so we ignore them. Point of clarification here. Specifications do not tell the trades how to do their work. <laughs> I, I say I, I know just enough about floor coverings to be dangerous. I am in no way a specialist in understanding what's involved in putting down floors. That is the floor trade. Um, specs that appear to be giving installation instructions, telling you what to do, those are manufacturer instructions. Um, that isn't a specification. Specifications describe what is required, not how to do it. And the other perception being instructions contained in specifications located in higher divisions supersede the instructions located in lower divisions. And what we oftentimes see is one, the specification is incorrect where it's specified the same test and one, say division three is applied in division nine without understanding one test is qualitative and the other test actually required for division nine is qualitative or yeah, qualitative versus quantitative two very similar words. Um, but a lot of times what happens is because testing is required, someone might apply this test in division three into division nine and say, right, uh, if you have to verify, you, you floor trade have to do this work. That's not the way the specifications work. The way the specification works is if a test is specified in one location, it applies to the work that that section actually occurs. If it occurs at a later stage in the, the book, you know, sequentially, division nine follows division three, that test shouldn't supersede an earlier test. It, the only time that test is used is when it applies to the work described in the section. Um, Understanding how to read the spec, this is a really, really deep dive. I, I'll warn you now, this isn't a 10, 10 minute read on, on, on that particular one. That's probably gonna be more like a 20 minute read just to let you know, but there is a deep dive on reading the specifications and how they will actually help you both cost the work and, and coordinate between the work that an individual trade has to do to work with other trades. So, but a quick, quick uh, summary of that. Specs are meant to be read. They're not shopping lists. The, they are a part of the contract document. The, uh, the specs are written to the constructor, not the trade. This is a big one. Um, the, the constructor coordinates the trades. Remember, the spec doesn't establish scope. The scope is established by the constructor. Specifications are a part of the contract documents, must be read. Um, and, and that should also mean that, that, that what's in the specification, contract documents, and the drawings are both contract documents, 
one has to complement the other. Specs oftentimes are said to overrule drawings. Never, ever, ever, ever. Overrule means that if the spec is wrong, then you're doing something incorrectly. The specification establishes the order in which we'll determine what has to be done. So a specification is read because it contains lots and lots and lots of words, provides clarity to the drawings. The drawings hopefully don't conflict with the same terminology used in specs. Um, and the two documents together are what form the, the contract. Uh, specification is divided into three parts, and this is done on purpose. So this is the trades, uh, the, the back end document. Yeah, the back end component, the individual okay. specifications that apply to the trades. Um, and, and part one, finally, like I said, we have three parts and spec writers are really creative. So we call it part one, part two, and part three. <laughs> General, you know, this is what sets up the coordination between the different divisions of the work or even different sections. Say you have a resilient floor covering trade and a tiling trade allows them to coordinate with each other about you know, who makes the transition between the two materials. Um, so part one, it also establishes uh, the coordination requirements. It, it sets up scheduling requirements specific to the trade. It sets up qualifications of the trades. It, 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 a lot of the stuff within part one is actually contained in greater detail in division one. So this is the tie back to, back to that, that front end, that the rules of the game. Uh, part one will cost you if you don't account for, say somebody wants to make a large scale mock-up and all you've done as a trade is look at the products and you've missed the mock-up entirely, that could cost you thousands of dollars. I didn't know about it is the excuse we hear about most often. It's like, well, it's right in your spec. Didn't you read that? Uh, no, do I have to do it? Yes, it says right here. So yeah, no, I don't want to be the bearer of bad news, but you got to read the whole thing. It's interesting because we operate a um, an inspection service that's specifiable. I mean, we've all heard of the Master Painters Institute have been operating a quality assurance program for decades. And so that appears in the general section. Yes. And I know when you get to the next slide, you're going to put up products. And um, I was... I was the, the estimator that I get a hundred page spec would land on my desk. I'd go straight to the products in the resilience section, 096500, add up my products, tack on a bit of overhead, add the labor, submit the price. And two months later, I, it had come back and I went, I, I always go like, oh my God, what did I miss? Yeah. And, that's, and, that's, hearing it. <clears throat> and I've heard that for over 40 years, Chris. In fact, I, I studied estimating at, at tech school. And that, that was always the biggest complaint of estimators. Oh, we won the job. Oh, oh no. Yeah, oh no. It's almost as bad as if you didn't get the job. So what's um, the incentive to go into the general, I mean, into the general section part one is um, to yeah. find out about testing requirements, find out about quality assurance. I don't know how many contractors I've talked to where they miss the quality assurance program and it costs them money. Yeah, and it goes back to that there's, there's more about the product than the name of the product. You're gonna have product A, B, and C, but what does that actually represent? It's the performance requirements for the project. So a simple listing of products doesn't actually tell you what the project requires. And so uh, particularly on larger projects, you'll see a complete performance requirement or performance criteria that has been written that goes along with the products and the products should illustrate that performance requirement, right? And also allow for options, by the way. Um, you know, if, if, if I, as a specifier, have looked at product A, B, and C, and you know about a product D that provides equal benefit to the project, I don't want to say it's equivalent because spec writers, we don't see things as being equal, but say meets all the must-have attributes of that general requirement or the, the performance requirement, go ahead and propose that for, for consideration. But that's what products do. So it's, it's, it also, products also sets up the performance requirements for the condition of the project. So it says starting condition is five millimeters, refer to the section something else for correction. So a performance requirement, can you expand on that? A performance requirement is five mil over 10 feet? 
That would be five millimeters over 10 feet or, or three meters for, the, uh, for the, the substrate condition because that sets up how much of the floor preparation materials the, the um, uh, uh, floor trade is actually responsible for. You know, the, the thin applied materials, the minor corrections that the floor trade is actually responsible for. Um, so they know what they're working with. Um, it also sets up, you know, uh, it could set up anti-static properties. It could set up, you know, like in hospitals, it could set up requirements, pieces that, you know, they don't end uh, with long-term, uh, uh, you know, wheeled materials or, or equipment being stored on the, on the, there's nothing worse than going to a, into a, uh, hospital operating room and having the anesthesiologist move around their, their dolly and it keeps rolling back into the divots created by the wheels in, in the floor because the glue is too soft. Or for that matter, roll downhill away from the operating table because the floor is sloped. So the third part is? Third part is execution. Um, and, and this is where we actually describe, uh, say, examination. This is where that qualitative aspect of, of testing comes into play, right? So there's an examination requirement that forms a part of execution that requires the, the, the trade, in, in the case we're, if we're talking about floor coverings, um, to examine the floor, to, to look at the floor and one, get information from the constructor to say that the floor is in fact ready for my work because all those tests and measurements have already been done, completed, the corrections have been made. Two, you know, I'm gonna make sure, I'm gonna do a, qual a qualitative test to make sure that my flooring materials are gonna stick to the floor. I'm gonna do a qualitative test to make sure that the, the floor surface isn't too damp or wet. There's no residual relative humidity that's gonna affect the adhesion or bubble up my floor after it's been installed. So there's things here that actually help with that. It also addresses inclusion of manufacturer's instructions, for instance. Understood, we're, we're at five minutes to two. Okay, excellent. We'll keep moving along. All divisions of the specification should be delivered to the trades. Everything should be read. Do not split the, the, the document apart. If you receive, and this goes to the contractors in, in the crowd. First thing you can do, it, it, it breaks the flow of information. Keep in mind that the information of spec flows from one trade to the next trade. So if you pull the spec apart, basically what it looks at is, is if everybody's on the 100 meter dash, first person across the finish line finishes, worst way to read the spec. Think about the spec more as a relay race. Each member of the, of the team passes the baton onto the next person. The person that wins is because of the efforts of everybody that's come before them. So really quickly here, because as, as, as you said, we're running out of time. We have a new spec. It introduces uh, a, the, a new name. We placed it based on master format. Uh, uh, it looked like this was a good fit as far as location is concerned. It's in division one. Division one is coordinated by the, by, by the constructor. We gave it a name. We've now submitted that name for consideration by the master format maintenance task team. We've yet to hear back whether or not there's any changes required to the name or the location. Um, but the spec is ready to go. It has all the related requirements that are associated with, uh, with flooring coordination. Uh, one of the things here you'll note are all of the spec notes that are included. These are notes that are written for the specifier to give the specifier guidance about what they need to know to finish the spec. And by the way, anything that deals with NFCA, um, if you are a subscriber to the uh, uh, their, their, their specification guide, their, their floor covering reference guide, you can click on the link and it will take you directly to that location on the website. We got the same links to the Tile Association as well, TTMAC. Correct. That, yeah. that's, that's deeper dive stuff, but if you need it, it goes beyond this specification, then it's the resources that are useful. Yeah, and, and it also gives that you got the, the specific guidance about what corrective materials you, you might want to consider for inclusion in the project based on the type of project that you're actually working with. Um, the other thing that we introduced was, was price and payment procedures, setting up that cash allowance. The best way to, to manage 
an unknown known unknown is to have an adjustment cost somewhere built into into the contract. Uh, we also created definitions because one of the things we found is that division three and division nine use the same words, but the words have different meanings depending on which trade is reading the word. So something like smooth means one thing to the concrete trade. It's something they do with their trowels and they set up their, their, their power floats. And, and for the fl floor trade, it means something that you do to the floor using, uh, using uh, uh, a compound and a trowel that you will try to achieve a smoothness. Smoothness, by the way, can't be, can't be defined. It's not quantifiable. It's just, a, you know, what is smooth? Different, diff I, I would interpret it differently than you would. Um, but at least, you know, with the International Concrete Repair Institute, we have a table that does define surface profile, which, which addresses smoothness, kind of like grits in sandpaper, 16 for very rough and, uh, you know, 100 grit for not so rough. And it's a very useful resource for getting the right surface on your concrete. Yeah, in fact, the worst thing you can do for the floor trades is to provide an absolute glass-like smoothness to the concrete because the, the, the surface of the concrete is very dense and probably won't take adhesive it's, very well. Which a typical spec <laughs> just says provide a smooth, flat surface. And then who knows how smooth it's going to it's going to be uh, be provided, and if it is too smooth, it needs to be remediated and bring in the shop blaster and more expense, unnecessary expense. Correct. And to help manage a lot of that, we set up administrative requirements. We we'll actually outlined the, the contributions from each of the project con uh, contributors, including the consultant, how the spec was actually written, what the constructor is going to do as far as a part of their quality management program. Um, we've established pre-construction meetings, including a separate meeting to discuss tolerances. Um, there would be also construction meetings, coordination of shared work outcomes, and most importantly, scheduling, particularly in, in fast track projects, because Concrete Guy in all likelihood will not see anything dealing with Division 9, because that content simply hasn't been written. Um, and of course, by the time the flooring guys come on site and, and need to coordinate their tolerances, it's too late. So there has to be some forward coordination there. Um, the section also talks about pre-installation testing and measurements. And you can see where we've set up concrete testing as a part of division three, substrate testing as a different section than, um, than, than the resilient floor coverings or, or tiling. This is what we call a common works uh, result specification section that provides coordination guidance for the constructor that work is required um, and that somebody is responsible. It doesn't say who is responsible, just that someone is responsible. It also talks about the continuation of, of concrete finishing tolerances um, in, in particular pointing out to the point cloud survey because in fact it works for both FFFL and straight edge. Um, we also outlined temperature uh, or protection during construction. Temperature and humidity being also very much underspecified. Um, typically, in a, in a space two goes in, we've got condensation all over the surfaces. Um, yeah, the the surface conditions have to be similar for application of all finishes, as similar to that of an occupied building. Um, we also have to protect the concrete. There's nothing worse than the sprinkler guy going into a space and putting up his pipe threading machine and dripping oil all over the floor because now we have to find a way to remove that oil and get it out of the concrete to make sure that the, the, the adhesives and mortars will stick. Um, we've worked with curing compounds. Curing compounds are always problematic. And whenever there's a bonding issue, I think probably 70% of the time we can point to curing compounds being, uh, being the cause of, of, of those kinds of flooring failures. I love that you've, let's just go back to that slide, Keith. I love that you put into uh, 3.2.1, the dew point issue, which has been around forever. No one's really talked about it. It seems like it's, it's a hot topic of recent uh, and you know causes maybe 90% of the moisture issues out there. Um, that's the conversation that's being had right now. Just because you can't see the condensation droplets on the surface of the concrete doesn't mean to say you have a condensation issue. You see, you see it very clearly on a window pane because the glass doesn't 
absorb the beads of water, but your, your concrete surface, if it is colder than the warm air in the room, it's just gonna turn into droplets of water and sink into the surface. And that's why your RH in your in, your in situ probe doesn't come down or you have a, a moisture issue that's just um, high all the time. Yeah, you know, and, and that's probably probably most of the concrete moisture issues that we run onto, on, on into on projects. Um, the, there's guidance there for managing the differential tolerances. Everybody has a contribution. The correction contractor, the, the constructor, the general contractor, and the consultant. Um, we've also identified all the site quality control issues, what kinds of measurements and testings uh, will be done. Um, of course, highlighting the QAP, if that's a choice on a project, the QAP being the quality assurance program, what the responsibilities are for the accredited uh, um, assurance provider, and, and you know, basically saying that any instructions are given through the architect or the engineer directly to the constructor, not just between the tester and, and the trade. Um, also, we identify the owner's quality audit. The owner's paying for this. The owner needs to be aware. Up front. Up front. And of course, we got some close out uh, activities because in the end, this is a division one section. There's a lot of division one content that has to be coordinated uh, with the spec section. So I know, I know we're running over time now, but a quick summary now, there is a gap that exists between division three and division nine. It's not the fault of either trade. The specification was not aware of the gap until we spoke to the trades in both divisions. The new spec now alerts the constructor to questions about managing the gap and the new spec identifies design coordination that helps construction meet budget, meet deadline, and deliver a quality project. Questions? Well, it's a, it's a deep topic, complex topic, hard to get it across in an hour. I just, uh, it, it requires ongoing conversation and, you know, a herd understanding. We've all heard of herd immunity in the last 12 months. Well, now we're looking to, to achieve herd understanding on this topic, and then everybody can come to the table and bid on their part of the project, whether you're a GC or a subtrade, and carry the cost for um, best practices to deal with this, to fill the gap, to pay for the gap, um, rather than just end up on site with uh, no solution, deadline closing in, and a fight on your hands. Oh, dear. I just found, uh, just going through some of the questions, apparently Zoom capped the, the number sure. of participants at 100. Yeah, we'll have to do, well, we'll be doing this again. Okay, <laughs> we will still you, may have to do it, you may have to do it a number of times. Yeah. I think so, yeah. Yeah.